Hey everybody, I don't know about you, but when I first uh, got my first real software job out of, out of college, I was really anxious. I thought that my code sucked, I was right. And my uh, first manager and first technical lead, they kind of observed in me this nervousness and anxiousness. Uh, and they, they, they kind of gave me, from their perspective, the sage wisdom to say, you know, yeah, you need to be thicker skinned, right? You need to grow a thick skin. And I took that as you know a serious uh, bit of advice, and, and then I realized that that was kind of bullshit, uh, <laughs> because us as humans, objectively, we have thin skin. And as I worked with these guys over the course of about six to eight months, I realized that their thick skin had the side effect of callousness, and more importantly, a lack of awareness of the world around them. They, they became very tunnel visioned, and they weren't all that effective at their jobs. Um, so this is not just for the thin skin, but more for the humans. This, is, this goes out to the humans in the crowd, uh, so hopefully you find this relevant. Um, and we're going to talk about politics, which of course comes from the Greek, it's a two-part word. Poly meaning many, and ticks meaning blood-sucking parasites. <laughs> <laughs> When people think of politics, like some people, they think of you know uh, men in suits and positions of power who steal from the rich and then give to the more rich, um, or some people think of like aspirational qualities, you know, a grassroots organization, how it can pull together and change things. And I intentionally just denigrated Republicans and promoted Democrats because I'm a Democrat, and also because we tend to think of politics, the word politics, especially in America, how polarized we are, as this battle. And I like this picture because this is a battle between two mythical, like toys of two mythical creatures because it couldn't matter less. Whoever wins, we lose. That's like our, <laughs> you know, kind of social opinion of politics. And when we talk about office politics, we just apply that same bias to our workplace. So um, when I talk about politics today, try to imagine something else. Try to imagine something that's not a, a traditional American political system, governmental politics. Um, when I say politics, I'm thinking about how to make a difference, how to, how to enact change like Todd's talk this morning, and specifically because so few people have the awareness and the intention to change the organization that they're in, think about trying to make an outsized difference, uh, you know, like a big splash of water, something that's a bigger change than the change that other people around you are making. And it's really easy to do because so few people are actually trying to. Um, so, so by building awareness and uh, uh, taking it seriously, I think it's something that all of us can do, and I, I hope that you find some of the stories I'm going to tell today useful. Um, and what we're going to do is break down to like four basic virtues, four things that I see in people who are very effective at navigating complex organizational situations and succeeding in, in the face of failure uh, and helping organizations change how they work uh, for the better. Uh, and I'm going to do that by, by relaying four stories from my personal career uh, as a consultant helping other organizations. Uh, being a consultant is great because you get to be an outsider and sort of take in a, a big picture view of an organization for a little while and swoop in and, uh, you know, watch it all burn down and then swoop right back out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for the people who find soft talks to be all common sense, uh, I just counted there's 96 stick figures in the various diagrams today. And so if you get bored from the commonness of my talk, feel free to count the stick figures and correct me at the end. Um, <laughs> It's a challenge. You, and it's worth 100 achievement points, Brian. <laughs> First thing I want to talk about is awareness, because everything else builds on awareness. Um, uh, without awareness, none of this is really all that useful. And if you take one thing away from this, uh, uh, the thought that you know, knowing what's going on around you outside of your job description is by far the most valuable thing that you could probably do for the people who wrote that job description. Uh, so, so let's just dive into that and talk about that a little bit. This, this picture reminds me, uh, or I picked it out because of a Japanese proverb, uh, which literally means the, the nail or the stake that sticks out gets hammered down. And uh, uh, maybe it's you know, obvious why it's an Asian proverb, but I think it applies kind of universally that we all tend to stick our heads down, uh, uh, try to stay out of getting too much attention or being too loud and noisy and kind of fitting in with uh, what we're doing and doing what we're expected to do, we show up nine to five and just do the job at hand. And we sort of have this sense that if we do that hard work every day and we're consistent and we color inside the lines that we'll get rewarded someday. Um, but I think that it's true that you can be too good. Uh, 
by, 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 by being great at your job and focusing so much on you and what you do, or so much on what you and your team do, uh, sometimes I've, I've seen teams that by overperforming, the overall organization actually moves slower. And it's counterintuitive, but it's, a, it's an example of a local optimization that, that uh, loses sight of what should be the global optimization, which is the whole organization succeeding. Whether that's making money or educating students or, or being a nonprofit and, and uh, you know, uh, curing people of guinea. Uh, and besides, hard work must have killed somebody. So uh, may, may as well not take it so seriously and move at a deliberate pace and act more intentionally. So this story uh, is an organization I went to. I came in very late, but this is how I perceived how this organization probably organically grew, and we're going to see how big of a mess this organization sort of became over time. It probably started off with a programmer and a user, and the programmer was writing some code that made the user's job easier, and over time it became clear that somebody else needed to come in and help hammer out what the requirements were, and so then they added a product owner at some step. But the product owner, you know, with them there to negotiate the requirements, eventually we had maybe multiple programmers and a designer as the software became more complex. And then as needs changed, you know, as, the, as maybe this became a valuable piece of software, then the business came in because suddenly they were stakeholders in this and they cared. So the product owner was also interfacing with the business and they kind of became a hub and spoke model of how information flowed in the organization. But as it became business critical, any time that things broke, it became a very serious and grave concern. And so then they hired a tester, right, to, to kind of be a check on the development team. And the organization became more complex. The product owner, you know, again, is now becoming uh, way more important. When I say product owner, it's kind of an agile term. Project manager, whoever's in charge of kind of, you know, this software, this product. So uh, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. They grew. You know, it's really a development team now. And uh, as, as the product became more mature and important, uh, change became more risky. So they hire a release manager, somebody who can kind of help free the team up so they can focus on like a development path, new work, but also you know maintaining stable branches of old existing code. Then they hire the sales guy to take some of the relief the, the pressure off the off the product owner. The sales guy interfaces with the users. Uh, he, he also communicates with the business who then relays you know changes to the system that need to be made to the product owner. And, and maybe the tester, kind of the, that, that one-off tester check kind of matures into a QA team that, that keeps making sure that bugs are staying out of the system. It's, I mean, this is a story that's been told a million times, so trying to lose through here. Sales guy becomes a sales team. They, they, they grew and grew and grew. Zoom out a little bit, and now you know, they got big enough that they needed an additional team. It was too big of a team. Last year when I came here, I talked about team growth and how you know, communication constraints make it such that teams can only really get so big. So they added a second team and a second product owner. But, and that yeah, is beautiful, right? It's an organic organization. <laughs> so they grow, they get a new office, and they, they resume out a little bit again. And the problem with these two teams is most teams, uh, most organizations aren't very good at splitting up teams into units that actually build totally separate things, right? They might split it up into like, you know, two products that are actually all sharing a database or sharing other resources. And so now that you've introduced two human teams that share resources, organizationally things become more complex again. So now the release, the release manager becomes a change management guy. Anytime anyone wants to release something, then uh, he has to go and make sure that the, the spinning plates keep spinning and, and, and it doesn't knock out of orbit the other product. A, a DevOps team, because they share runtime resources and servers, is now a new responsibility that has to coordinate between both of those teams to make sure both of their needs are met. A DBA, maybe, if they share a database. Got some DBAs and former DBAs in the room, I know. Looking at Jackie, she doesn't do good. Um, uh, who, who has to, you know, kind of be the uh, the, the official say so on the data schema and, and control change there. A lot of things about controlling change, right? And so this organization, the way that it grew, is very change averse, which made the business say, "Why well, you know build software fast enough? Why do you think is now? It used to be so fast. I remember a decade ago when I asked for something and then I got it." I miss the 90s. And <laughs> so the business, the business, they show up to conferences and they hear about all this agile stuff and they get really excited about, uh, and it's not about agile, it's about every decade there's a new trend, a new you know, buzzword, and they, get, they sign up. And so they bring in some outside consultants uh, and they, 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 
they, they intentionally designate them awesome team, right? They're agile, and the agile folks sold them on business value by having business value uh, that we're going to work directly with you, we're going to build the software, we're going to work in really tight iterations with you, and we're going to deliver great stuff, and it's going to be much faster than your current organization can go. I was on awesome team. I, that's how I was hired. But we, I worked with somebody who's a, a really big in systems thinking. So if these diagrams kind of make you excited about how people, the interrelations between folks, look into, uh, just do a Google search on systems thinking. And there's a bunch of literature and online community uh, about the unintended consequences of our actions. And since I knew that was a speciality, the fir from the first day I asked him, sort of give me a lay of the land and let's kind of look at this from an academic kind of detached perspective. So from day one, we could tell that we were going to be a problem. <laughs> because we got a hall pass from the business, from all the executives. That meant that we could push on the DBA and say, hey, we need a, like 20 column changes a day. We need all this stuff. And they didn't really you know, appreciate that because they had to fill out three pages of work for every single change. And we just got to push on them and push on them and push on them. You, you see all of these circles are, are bi-directional. It's like two-way feedback. This is a one-way street. You told them how it was going to be, and if they didn't like it, we'd be like, well, you know, I could just call my friend the CIO over here and ask what he thinks about this column change. You know, the DevOps team, we told them we needed a new server, and they said, well, that takes three months and a million dollars. And we said, all right, cool. Well, in two weeks when the server's up, that's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, change management, the change management team, uh, they, they were... They saw us coming from a mile away, you know, like slamming doors and stuff, and we finally pinned them down. And then by the end of the meeting, they're foaming at the mouth, and, you know, every other word is socks. You know, sorry. <laughs> if you work in a publicly traded company and you want to end a conversation, just say, oh, because of socks, we can't do that. <laughs> no one knows. Big. <laughs> it's all fun, right? Um, yeah, so we pushed on everyone else. We definitely pushed on QA. We said, well, you know, we're, because we're agile and we kind of we don't have bugs, so we don't need you guys. So you, just, <laughs> you, you can take her. You, you can relax. And of course, they were all afraid for their jobs. You know, without bugs, what will we do? <laughs> but the businessman, they were because <laughs> they were getting work in software quickly for the first time ever. And I've seen this pattern repeat at like five or six clients. And uh, what I've observed about it is that by pushing on everyone else. Uh, but working directly with the business, you make them very happy on project one. But then on project two, this little red box is kind of like a blinder to the other organiz the, uh, the organization around you. And, and all of the sort of background political machinations that you've been so uh, naive from. Because they've all been very grumpy. They're not very happy about, A, the lack of uh, attention that they're getting from the business or respect. And, how much you've been pushing them around. Change management's really not happy. <laughs> and they all plotted, in this particular instance, they were all plotting against us. I mean, I could overhear them, and no matter how much we tried to win them over, they were all plotting to wreck us for project two. So project two comes along, and suddenly we don't get the database columns that we need, or stuff is broken, or the, the environment's down all the time, and it needs to be restarted every 20 minutes. It's almost as if they were, you know, intentionally guffing us up. And then, of course, they did, and our project was a massive failure, and I saw it coming from a mile away, and this happened. We got knocked out. Luckily, I lined up future work because I saw it coming. But the executives did it. But they, you know, their executives, they were taking care of. They found new awesome jobs. And, trickle down. Yeah. <laughs> trickle down, exactly. Um, and so, replaced by the new business. New executives come in, and more or less now, the organization looks just like it did before. And I'm sure that as it grows more and it slows down more, this pattern will probably repeat. So that's a little bit about awareness. I mean, that's just a story about crazy organizational growth and, and us, uh, the, difference, the difference being, I mean, if we'd been more upfront and aware rather than just kind of critiquing and observing this kind of slow motion car wreck, uh, if we'd been more aggressive about pulling people in, uh, it maybe it wouldn't have ended up that way. As it was, we could kind of only have a couple weeks of visibility in terms of what was happening. But that awareness was invaluable to me personally, even at that project in the <laughs> because it helped me uh, see it coming again. So in future situations, now I'm going to avoid situations like this. And maybe, you know, you seeing this story is probably not going to really uh, have that same impact on you. Because for me, it was very personal and like, extremely stressful and emotional and all sorts of cues and stuff. But if the takeaway for you could be, 
awareness is really, really important in understanding the broader organizational system, then victory. Uh, another, another virtue that's important to me is empathy. See how I'm doing on time. Uh, so I gotta speed up. Empathy is, uh, uh, I like the platonic definition of empathy, which means I feel what other people feel. Um, and the problem is, this is a picture of you at work. Uh, and, and sometimes when we're happy and everyone else around us is sad, or we perceive that they might be, empathy can actually be really dangerous, because then we just become like everybody else. Um, but it's a very important tool to be able to put yourself in the shoes of other people in order to figure out how you can uh, know what incentivizes them and know how to help them better. And so one way that most developers uh, can understand empathy is I think most developers are really good at advocating for the invisible user. The user of the system that they're going to build that's usually not in the room, they can be like the Lorax and stand up and say, hey, I speak for the user who cannot speak for he has no tongue which works better for treaties as an example, but <laughs> who's not in the room, and Dr. Seuss and so, that, so forth. Um, this is a, a brief story about a product owner who came up with a great idea, worked at a shipping facility, they had uh, independent contractors who shipped freight, and it was previously all checklist, kind of paper, kind of paper, and a friend of mine worked on a team where they converted that to an iPad app. Real simple, real straightforward, easy win project, everyone was happy. And then, had another idea this time in the bathtub, and the, the product owner this time was thinking like, well, we've already got this sort of, you know, all Wi-Fi, all on the road, all GPS system in place. What if we had the business owner who sits in the desk, he's got a smartphone, and all these things have radios, so I could tell that, you know, Todd is out for deliveries, and Leon's pumping his gas, and, uh, you know, uh, let's say Brian is out eating lunch, and, and Eaton is sleeping in front of his truck. <laughs> and the developer, the programmer, who sits there, he's in, he gets all these stories about pro like location tracking and uh, monitoring and kind of giving all these crazy stocky tools to the bosses. He's thinking like, well, what if I was one of these delivery people and they started tracking me without telling me about it? And my manager started like, you know, stalking me and micromanaging where I was about every single time of day. I wouldn't really like that. And so by, by having that empathy, the programmer became an advocate inside of the organization for privacy concerns. You know, he, he brought those concerns to the product owner, and the product owner didn't really buy it. So he went to the legal department, and then the legal department was like, just saw liability lawsuits out the wazoo, and then the product owner totally bought in, because <laughs> they had a good choice. So empathy is really, really important. It's a super valuable skill. Uh, it can be dangerous if you're overly empathetic, but targeted empathy to, to try to understand who Everyone that you deal with every day, like what incentivizes and motivates them, what's pushing on them, pulling on them, uh, you can't understand them until you spend some time analyzing that. Unity is also really important. It's one of my favorite teams. Uh, this is a fun story. Um, a lot of times when we work on teams, we have this sort of like naive, childlike view that everyone in the organization is working towards the same goal. We're all on the same team. Uh, we're trying to get the, the same thing accomplished. And I, I would say that on any, any organization that does more than one thing, or does one really big thing at least, uh, there's internal turf wars, there's internal struggles. There's uh, somebody winning means that somebody else has to lose in at least some way internally. And on this team, uh, there, was, there was a strong sense that executives, some half the organization would be really happy if we did a great job, and the other half of the organization would, do, uh, would be uh, really poorly off that we did a great job. And they were actually incentivized by our failure. So this is our team of eight people, great looking guys. And we, on day one, we had this very, very obvious sense that surrounding us were a whole bunch of people who really, really were acting in bad faith. Uh, you know, whether they were architects or people on other teams or executives who like to walk on the floor. And so we responded in the you know, traditional agile way of like putting up a wall. So putting a wall up around the team and, say, and insulating the developers, uh, I was just a developer on the team, insulating developers from everyone else around us uh, so that we could at least have a private space to formulate and work on decisions in a low pressure way that, that we weren't gonna get uh, yelled at for uh, and, and cook on ideas and build stuff regardless of how it was implemented and to make sure that the business was happy and we're succeeding and we're on target. So like, say we had idea A, we're gonna use this framework. The phenomena that kept repeating itself, even after we built this wall, was suddenly all the dudes on the outside of the team knew that we had had idea A. 
and they came after us and they said, hey, you're off the reservation, or hey, we standardized the idea F. And, and uh, they yell at us and they start these big things and we just we floated on EAA. We weren't really sold on it, but it kept happening over and over and over and we were never getting anything done and we were just arguing all the time. So clearly we had a mole, right? We had somebody in the team who was, who was leaking information outward, or we were bugged. I guess we never thought about that. We just simply assumed somebody in the team was. <laughs> And so my, uh, the, the tech lead and the, the kind of delivery lead who was in charge of making sure it got it done, they were, um, they were really brilliant. What they did was they kind of took everyone out to lunch, so it took about a week. Uh, all of us went out to lunch one at a time under the auspice of being kind of like a performance review, uh, but it wasn't a performance review. Uh, it, was, it was a uh, kind of casual strategy session and they relayed ideas to us about, hey, guys, we think we're going to try, you know, uh, mixing, you know, idea A and B and C. That's what they told me in our meeting. It's like, we're going to use this framework and this framework and this library. And, and uh, like, maybe this backup plan. But for person number two, they only shared ideas A and B. And for person number three, they shared idea A and C. And for the, uh, the fourth person on the team, they shared idea B and C. So we're all getting slightly different information, but it sort of feels like the same thing. So when we talk to each other, nothing gets really missed. But then you have the second half, person five only got idea A, and person six only got idea B, and person seven only got idea C. And then with person eight, they were just, you know, they, they relayed none of those ideas. They just said something else. So with eight people on the team, we all got a slightly different version of reality. And then they waited. <laughs> And strangely, idea combo AC emerged, and somebody yelled at me for something that made no sense and had nothing to do with what I heard. And we identified person number three was the mole. It was kind of like a game, right? Um, <laughs> we didn't know. All the developers were totally unaware. This is like a ghost of brilliant tech lead and brilliant you know, delivery lead in terms of being able to identify this. So we found that uh, you know, person number three was especially gifted at working at this one-off single sign-on problem that was going to take him four months in the corner by himself. So he was uh, okay. <laughs> Unity, right? Really, really simple stuff. Um, it, it, so I, 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 in reading and prepping for this, I read some cliff notes on Sun Tzu's Outer War, and uh, one of the comments and one of the common themes seemed to be that Unit cohesion, unity, people working together and working well as a group was more important than armaments and size and so many other variables. And so, so to me, everyone being on the same page and normalizing and being on the same team, at least for the goal of what we're trying to accomplish, is super important. If somebody's working against that, getting them out of your critical path is, is extremely important if you want to be successful. Uh, last story I want to share is about patience. Because sometimes you're not in control to be dastardly clever and, and manipulate your environment such that you get what you want. I mean, I am, but maybe you're not, <laughs> you're not there yet. Um, patience, though, is, is, is key. Patience is really important because sometimes you just have to wait. And for people like me who are always trying to fix everything, this is the hardest one. This is very difficult to just sit it out and let things run their course and not try to interfere. Because a lot of times when you try to interfere, uh, uh, a bad situation becomes associated with you and it becomes your problem and then you own it and it stresses you out in ways that it doesn't need to. So um, this is about bad bosses. Uh, probably something you can't relate to. <laughs> um, in an organization I was brought in just to do a little co consultation, a little bit of, um, they asked me to give, give them advice about this very obscure technical thing and on day one I knew that that was issue number 85 on their list of problems. Uh, they didn't know it, but they had a terrible boss. And 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 looking at it, you know, he had peers in the organization that were good guys, that were that were that were that were acting totally in good faith and very good and confident what they did. But this guy in particular, clearly acting in bad faith, maybe a little crazy. Uh, uh, he was a ticking time bomb, and a lot of bad bosses are this way. It, it's almost like he spent so much time. This is a pattern I've seen in a lot of, of bad leaders. So much time clawing at his way over all of the like, you know, vanquished souls to get to the top of an organization to get all this power, and then once he had the power, he didn't know what to do with it. And so it's only a matter of time until he's going like, to completely implode. And uh, uh, that's what I let happen. So uh, sometimes you have to allow others to fail, or, or, or nothing in the organization is going to change, because if you force success, 
then it'll uh, uh, just kind of reinforce, positively reinforce all these bad behaviors. So this guy's at the top of the organization. He started off with three business analysts, three people who specialize in the domain, but didn't have any experience in management, didn't have any experience with any software per se. And he immediately promoted them all to product owner slash project manager types. And the reason he did it, of course, was because they didn't have any experience, and so they'd always listen to everything that he said. The reason he did three of them was so he could play one off of the other and, and retain control and dominance over the situation. I'm inferring a little bit. He didn't tell me this. But. <laughs> and each of them had a different team. And uh, as, as time went on very quickly, you know, the product owner sort of worked together, tried to figure out what their job was, how to do it well, but there was a lot of rampant confusion at that level, how they were going to get anything done, how they were going to coordinate, how these three teams all building one technical product would interface, and how, how the stuff that they built would interface. And that confusion trickled down to, to the teams themselves, because then they had no, no, no real direction, no clear requirements and specification, uh, 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 mixed signals. And before long, the, 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 the boss man started exerting pressure, deadline pressure, arbitrary uh, uh, constraints. You know, we've got to get a demo out by this. We've already sold this thing that doesn't exist and it needs to be ready in, in three months uh, in customers' hands. And all that pressure just had the same effect because the project owners didn't know how to, because they didn't have that experience and that training, didn't know how to successfully insulate the developers from that pressure so that they could keep working and being creative and getting stuff done, that pressure just went straight down, and everyone was super frazzled by the time that I showed up. So the product owners felt like they were drowning, and they were acting like it. They were all over the place, you know, like clearly updating their resume <laughs> most of the day. Uh, uh, not checked out so much as just numb. And the, and the teams were sad. They were really sad. These guys, I felt really, really bad because like, they weren't showering. I'm not kidding. Like, it smelled really bad. They spent a ton of money on an awesome Agile team space, and it smelled bad on the first day. I was there the first day, and, it was, and the, it's not because they were working hard. It was not because they were there all night. It's because their lives were bad. They, they were there at 10 a.m. and out at 4 p.m., right? And they just didn't have any will to be there. And it was a really, really sad, sad, sad place to be. <coughs> Sometimes I'm this guy, and I think some of us are, like where, you know, constantly want to, like this iguana, like uh, snatch uh, uh, success from, from the jaws of defeat. And uh, that would have been the wrong thing to do. In this organization, if I had been able to swoop in and been Superman and fix everything, the net effect is that this guy would get to run another project and build a new product and ruin the lives of a whole new set of people. Instead, I, I just decided to be the sloth and chill and hang out and eat some bamboo and <laughs> watch it all burn up. <laughs> so patience. Uh, yeah, sometimes that sometimes the best thing you can do to help a situation is nothing, um, uh, and that's the sort of thing that you can learn through some awareness and some experience without being, you know, some political mastermind or uh, uh, a confrontational and adversarial person who like really gets off on conflict, like in Jen's talk earlier. I'm not an adversarial person. I'm very, very averse to, to, to confrontation. But I think that uh, uh, with awareness uh, uh, and with a little bit of empathy and a realization that by working all together, we can build really good stuff as long as everyone's on the same page and the same goal, uh, you know, we can all build great stuff and focus on the good. Uh, so you know, get political is, I guess, the message. Uh, my name is Justin Searles, uh, uh, like the mentioned, we have a company called Test Double. I'd love if you got feedback or just tweeted at me and uh, what you thought uh, at, at Searles, my last name, and if you have anything to say to me, uh, justin at testdouble.com is my, my email address, and then there's my blog. So thank you very much, I really appreciate it.